Good morning. My name is Amy Schumacher. I'm the leader of the praise team. I'll be reading the scripture today. It's Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. Chapters 1 and 2. Uh, so if you brought your Bible, pull it out and turn to Genesis. That's the first book of the Bible. Or you can pull out the Pew Bible in front of you. Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. 
and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Thanks, Amy. I'm grateful for your leadership this morning and always grateful again that all of you are here. And welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Grateful that you're with us as well. At this point, I'd like to invite any kiddos who are out uh, in our midst this morning, roughly ages uh, preschool through early elementary to go with Craig and Deb Brady. They're leading our worship readiness time today. They'll be back uh, with us as we close the service this morning in time for our celebration of Holy Communion. Uh, but as always, this time provides a more age-appropriate time to reflect on the scriptures and uh, dig into the conversation for the day than the message here. If you haven't already, I'd just point you toward the bulletin that you were handed when you came in this morning and hope that you would take that perforated connection card on the back. Go ahead and tear it off now. If you haven't already, we can all make that noise together. Uh, and be prepared to place that in the offering later in the service. Uh, that connection card is a tool that we use every week when we gather for worship uh, to offer ourselves to God. And so you can share prayer requests on there that you'd like shared in different ways. Uh, you can sign up for different things happening in the life of our body together. But as always, first-time guests and long-time members and everywhere in between, uh, we hope that you'll fill that out and make that an offering of yourself. Uh, again, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here, and I promise we're not going to read all of Genesis 1 again. Um, but do want to spend some time reflecting on that this morning. And uh, my hope in having that whole piece read is that you begin to see some of the patterns that develop in that great uh, creation poem. Um, I do not, and would give you permission, not to read that as science textbook or as history book, uh, but to understand that that origin story, uh, Genesis 1 through those first three verses of Genesis 2, is one of two creation stories that exist in our scriptures. They're back to back with each other there in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Uh, there's a great deal for us to understand in that text about who God is and who God has created us to be and who God is calling us to be. Um, so we'll dig into that in just a few moments. But this morning I want to begin uh, with confession. They say it's good for the soul. Uh, we'll give it a try. Um, at best, I have a love-hate relationship with being outside. I, I want to be the kind of person who loves to be outside all the time. I really do. Uh, and I don't know if it's because I live in this particular part of the country where the colds of winter and the highs of summer can just be so painful and excruciating. Uh, but at best, I have a love-hate relationship with the great outdoors. Uh, I remember very fondly, just a few weeks back, on the last day of school, it was a Thursday for our kids, they only had a half a day, and so... Uh, the kids and I spent that afternoon uh, pulling some weeds in a bed and planting some flowers and putting some mulch down. And it, it was a lovely way to spend a couple of hours together. And that next Friday morning, I got up and I spent some time sitting outside on the porch, kind of surrounded by the work that we had done. And uh, I listened to the birds sing while I drank my coffee and read my Bible. And I, I sat for a while and just watched the squirrels play in the trees. And, and it was lovely to be outside. And then there was last Saturday. And I was at Camp Chippewa last Saturday morning, and somewhere in the heat of midday, as we did the long walk on the dry, dusty road from archery, and if you know Camp Chippewa, you can picture where archery is, to where we were going to have lunch in the dining hall, I found myself, you know, wondering out loud, what in the world were people thinking when they came across this part of the country in covered wagons or stagecoaches, and they got here and said, yeah, this seems like a good place to, to set up camp and, and to live, right? The heat it can be so oppressive and so uncomfortable. And, and so again, I want to be the kind of person that just loves to spend time outside. Uh, sometimes it's a struggle uh, to want to be outside. And one of the things that I'm aware of uh, as a person of faith is that when I struggle to be connected to what's happening outside in God's creation, uh, I struggle to be connected to God the God who created it and who created me. And, and when I struggle to be connected to and to be paying attention to God's creation and the way in which God has created and is creating me, um, I fail to live fully into who I'm created to be and invited to be as a follower of Jesus and as a person of faith. 
And one of the things that I'm aware of, though there are some of you who are hardy outdoors persons and love it, uh, I don't believe that I'm alone in my struggle, right? Um, culturally, I don't want to blame the invention of any one thing, but central air conditioning has had a profound impact on our desire to be outside, hasn't it? And add to the mix other conveniences of our lives, you know, uh, our dryers that allow us to not hang our laundry in our backyard, our automatic garage door openers that allow us to just pull into our garage and go into our kitchen or our house. And uh, we spend uh, far littler time outside than just a generation or two ago. In fact, I found this week a recent study done by the Environmental Protection Agency says that the average amount of time that a person spends outside today is about 7% of their time. Uh, their estimate is that we spend 93% of our time uh, inside. Uh, they're saying 87% uh, in a building or in our house, 6% in our vehicle, uh, and that leaves us about 7% of our time. Th that's one half of one day each week that we spend outside. And I'm also aware that when we're inside, uh, over the last decade or two, increasingly as a people, we give a significant amount of attention to screens in front of our faces. Sometimes they're this far, uh, sometimes they're further away. Uh, but a study, again, that I un uncovered this week said that on average, the best guess today is that six hours and 43 minutes of any given day is spent by the average American looking at a screen. Six hours and 43 minutes a day at a screen. And so as a people, we are increasingly disconnected, uh, not just from God's great outdoors, but also from the rest of creation, uh, our brothers and sisters, the communities that can surround us. And I fear that as we struggle to be connected to the great outdoors and to the community that surrounds us, it negatively impacts our ability to be connected to the God who created us and is calling us to be in relationship with and, and partner with God in the care of creation. And so again this morning, I want us to spend a little bit of time looking at that Genesis 1. It's really the first of two creation stories that we find there. If, if you want to, as an exercise this week, spend some time reading Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in its entirety. Um, different pieces of the creation story are nuanced in different ways in those stories, but part of what I love about the story in Genesis 1 is the patterns and the rhythms that exist. And that's why I often refer to it as a creation poem, because there's this this rhythm in the unfolding of the story. I'd invite you to open up your Bible, if you're carrying it with you especially, or one of those pew Bibles in front of you, and look with me briefly at Genesis 1. I thought about having Amy tip you off on this before she read it, but uh, did not do that. Uh, but I wonder, as you look at this, as you remember what you heard a, a few moments ago, um, are there patterns that you see established and developed in this? What are some of those patterns in this creation story. The first one's really obvious and, and simple. God creates, right? There's this rhythm. And God creates by speaking and acting both. God speaks something and then it happens and God steps back after creating and we see the second pattern established there. What does God do after creating? God blesses it, says this is good. God says this is good, God blesses it. And in this Genesis 1, we're told that God names things, right? Both that blessing, that calling good, that naming indicate that God continues in relationship with creation. God is not a God who creates and then just kind of leaves us all to our own devices and steps back, but God continues to be at work evaluating God's creation, naming God's creation. And then there's another pattern, less about God's action, but just about the way the story unfolds. Uh, do you see another rhythm repeated in this story? Each segment comes to a close. There was evening and there was morning on that day. There was evening and there was morning on that day. And we'll come back to that pattern in just a moment and what that might signify for us. But um, it's not how we often think about time, right? Our days begin. There's morning and there's evening. There's morning and noon and evening. Uh, but the rhythm established here in creation, there's evening and there's morning in each of those segments of time. And so the God who creates, um, creates uh, the waters, creates the separation of the waters, creates the land, creates the plants and the vegetation that's on the land. And at least as the story unfolds in this telling of it, uh, kind of coming to the end of that season of creating, uh, God creates humankind in God's image. And then starting in verse 28 and following, we see a little bit about the established uh, invitation for us as humankind in creation. God blessed them, the humankind created in God's image. And God said to them, 
Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you the humankind created in God's image. I've given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And then verse 31, bringing this to a close, God saw everything that God had created, looking back over the previous days. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning on that sixth day. And if you flip briefly to look at those first few verses of Genesis 2 that we already read, uh, following these six days of creating, God rests on that seventh day. God has created, created humankind. God has invited humankind to be co-creators and caregivers with God. But the pattern is established uh, from the very beginning that there's evening and there's morning uh, on that day. Now this pattern of evening and morning is the way in which both the ancient Hebrew people and our Jewish brothers and sisters today track and think about the day. Um, The day begins at sundown, the prior day. That's why Sabbath is celebrated on Friday evenings, though Saturday is the Sabbath day in the Jewish faith. And the idea is that this evening and morning on this seventh day is a place where we rest. We partner with God. We co-create with God. We are caretakers of what God has entrusted to us, and we rest. And that in that resting is a part of what it means to be connected to and caring for creation. Now, I I don't know about you, uh, but I don't rest very well. Um, I I maybe sit still sometimes physically, but mentally I don't rest very well. I find that we're always rushing to what's next and processing through things. and, And that in the midst of that, in this culture in which we're increasingly air conditioned and inside and increasingly looking at screens and disconnected from others around us, it's a struggle to be connected to the God who created us and who calls us and desires to be in relationship with us. And so this morning, we're beginning a a five-week series called God and the Great Outdoors with the hope uh, that over the next four weeks, as we look at some of the different activities we might do outdoors, rafting and hiking, camping and fishing, uh, we'll see some specific applications for our lives as followers of Jesus. Uh, But the foundation that we lay today, uh, we hope, is a foundation of understanding the God of the Great Outdoors who creates us, desires a relationship with us, and invites us to walk and to grow in that relationship. Now, I, I, don't, um, I don't do science real well, and I already was uh, identified an error in my uh, 815 presentation of this. So uh, the whole point of what I want to share here is uh, how I struggle to kind of grasp the vastness of God's creation. And so if I make a mistake in some of what I share, that's just uh, affirmation of the point that I struggle to wrap my brain around this, right? There are some simple and some obvious ways that we can see the majesty of God's creation and take awe in God's creation. Um, Think about those things that are the big, breathtaking parts of creation. The sunrises and sunsets that we can see on the horizon, the night stars, the beautiful blue skies with clouds and lush green that surrounds us. There are those big ways in which we can see the majesty of God with our eyes. And there are small, uh, intricate and intimate ways in which we can see the majesty of God with our eyes. You know, with our kind of middle school science understanding, even if we don't get how it works, we know that ourselves are are multiplying and dividing as we grow and so our bodies grow over time and and when we have an injury and we cut ourselves we know that that healing process comes uh, through these miraculous ways in which our bodies are wired we can see the vastness of god's majesty when we see seeds that are planted that sprout that grow that flower that bear fruit that contain seeds that continue that cycle again there are these little small intimate intricate ways in which the majesty of God can be witnessed. But what I really struggle with is uh, sometimes the bigness and the smallness that exists in the ways that we can't even see and understand with our naked eyes, right? Uh, I understand that they, whoever they are, now estimate that there might be 100 billion galaxies as part of creation, right? I cannot fathom 
what that looks like. And that in any one of those hundred billion galaxies, there would be a vast number of suns and stars. And, and that even in our galaxy, there might be as many as a hundred billion black holes. That's what I screwed up in the last service. I said in our solar system, there would be a hundred billion black holes. And I was corrected that, you know, we'd have some problems if there were black holes in our solar system. Again, the vastness of God's creation is beyond what I can even comprehend. And the same exists on that kind of microscopic level, those things we cannot see or understand with our eyes. Again, I have this vague recollection of a seventh grade science class where we looked at the anatomy of a cell, and I kind of think I understand that, but, but the cells that are divided into molecules are divided into atoms, and now we're saying that maybe there are as many as a hundred different subatomic particles that exist as a part of creation. The microscopic, finite nature of God's creation is almost unfathomable. Uh, again, um, God's creation is marvelous and majestic. And my fear is that oftentimes I miss it when I'm disconnected, inside more than outside, looking at a screen more than not. And my fear is that when we fail to take seriously the majesty of God's creation, we struggle to understand who God is and who we are created to be as part of God's creation. But the flip side of that I also believe is true. When we take time to intentionally observe the majesty of God's creation, I believe it helps us understand who God is and who we are created to be. And so my invitation to you over these next weeks uh, would be to think about not just you and how you observe the majesty of creation, but to think about what that means for us as broader community as well. Because none of us are going through this life alone. We are all connected in community to others who are with us in this room right now, to others who are with us online, to others who would worship at 8.15 or at 11 o'clock this morning, to others who are traveling in this season, we live as community. And the way in which we understand and engage God as individuals shapes and forms the way in which we understand and engage God as community. And I believe that when we, as community, are increasingly aware of what God is doing in our lives, it helps us as individuals and as a community live into who God is calling us to be. I believe that when uh, we're willing to step back just a little bit and to let go of our need and our desire for control and to trust that the God who created everything is in control of everything and simply invites us to partner with God, that it makes a difference in how we live in relationship with God and with others. I believe that as we continue living into our mission as a community, we are benefited when, as individuals, we take time to be intentional about observing the majesty of God in creation. And so for this week, uh, I offer you two uh, specific invitations. They're related to one another, but um, the first would be at some point this week to step outside in a time or a place that you would not regularly to intentionally observe the majesty of God in creation. To be intentional about a time and a place to look at the bigness, the vastness of God in creation. And at the same time, the second invitation uh, is to be intentional this week about looking for a time to be mindful of God in the minute, intricate, intimate details of creation. Right? Whether that's the way in which you or your children or your grandchildren are growing and you marvel at that whether that's the way in which something in your life or somebody else's life is healing because of those miraculous processes that we don't even really see but unfold slowly over time in our bodies. Uh, find time this week to be intentional about marveling at both the bigness and the smallness of God's work in creation. And my hope would be for each of us that as we continue walking through this series over the next four weeks, and as we think about those specific ways in which we might be shaped and formed in our faith, the, the metaphors that exist, the lessons that exist in hiking and rafting, camping and fishing, that in all of it, we would be increasingly aware of the God of all creation, the God of the great outdoors, who created us, calls us to share in being co-creators and caretakers of creation, and invites us as part of that to 
to rest, to step back, to observe, to be aware of, and to marvel at what God is doing and what God is planning and will be doing in our lives and in the world. May we be a people shaped and formed by the God who creates and who loves us and who calls us to partner as co-creators for the sake of all of God's creation.